All right, let's go ahead and open this wonderful prayer in Ephesians. Uh, we've been working through uh, this prayer, kind of looking at it as a whole. I had a great question this week, uh, and that question was, uh, someone asked me, what is sonship prayer? And I thought, well, you've come to the right place because that's what we're talking about here this morning, sonship prayer. Uh, when I refer, some of the things I write, some of the things I say, I keep talking about people engaging not just in prayer, but in sonship prayer. And the question was, what's the difference between what I'm referring to as sonship prayer uh, and what we could call, I guess, traditional prayer, uh, religious prayer? And there's a big difference. It's like a night and day difference. Uh, religious prayer, traditional prayer, where one is taught to barge into the presence of God and tell him what he ought to be doing, what you want him to do, and then sit back and wait for him to do it and get mad when he hasn't done it quick enough for you. That's not the prayer. That's not sonship prayer. Uh, that's a maybe pagan superstitious prayer, uh, but it's not sonship prayer. Sonship prayer is what we're learning about here. What we see uh, Paul doing, he is in, he's carried into the presence of God through Pauline grace mystery truth. We, this is all from Ephesians, or excuse me, Philippians 4, uh, focusing, when he looks into Pauline grace mystery truth, focuses on the wonderful, uh, praiseful, truthful things you learn about the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. Focus on that, rejoice in that, think about that, uh, talk to God about that, commune with God about that. That then generates requests through the Spirit, talking to him about him and his things. Uh, and that generates requests through the Spirit. And those requests, then guess who gets to go do it? We do. So that's the difference. Traditional prayer barges into God's presence, tells him what he should be doing. Sonship prayer enters in and rejoices and communes about God and his things, and it gives us ideas about what we should be doing. And that's what Paul's going to do uh, in this prayer. In this prayer, Paul is going to pray to God. Uh, he's going to pray that they be filled with the wisdom of God that comes from the revelation of the mystery so they can be brought in the full knowledge of God. But then you know what he does? He goes and tells them what they need to be filled with the wisdom of God according to the revelation of the mystery to know God. He's going to tell them what they need. They need the hope of his, call, of his calling. They need to know about them being his inheritance. They need to know about the great power he's exercising to carry this out. He doesn't go and tell God what to do and then just go take a nap and expect God to go do it. God's already done everything. He's all, we already told us in Ephesians 1.3, he's already given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now the job is in prayer to go and access those blessings, uh, to take those blessings now and put feet. I guess it's kind of a common way we say that, put feet to our prayers. Uh, Paul doesn't just go in, barge into God's presence and tell him what he ought to be doing with the Ephesians. Uh, he makes these re prayerful, rejoicing requests, and then he goes and answers the prayer himself, telling them what they need to have what he's requesting. So that's the difference between sonship prayer uh, and uh, traditional prayer. It's a night and day difference. Uh, prayer isn't something passive. Yeah, I pray and then I'm just going to wait for God to do something. Prayer, uh, especially take away all my problems, uh, prayer is active communication with God that sets us in motion to do what he wants. Traditional prayer says you can get God to do what you want. Sonship prayer says, no, God, prayer is God's way to get me to do what he wants, put feet to our prayers. Uh, and so then we've also been looking at here, stressing this hope concept. We pointed out in verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and loved all the saints, and then dot, 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 see there's something missing there. And now you might not pick up on it, but if you are really familiar with the scriptures, you'll realize what he should have put there, what he what he could have put there, what he would usually put there, is their hope, faith, love, and hope. Go to uh, Colossians and you'll read. He talks about the Colossians, their faith, love, and their hope. He comes, he's writing to the Ephesians and he says their faith, he says their love, there's no hope. 
He leaves off the hope. And then in his prayer, he says his prayer request, uh, well, when he fulfills his prayer request, he's going to give them the hope of his calling. Uh, that's a very important thing. Uh, the, what is the significance of this hope? I suggest leaving hope out gives us a clue to why Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians. I have some uh, uh, commentaries, even mid acts commentaries, uh, and they'll suggest here that the, Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians because the Ephesians were if the only, if not the only, one of the few assemblies spiritually mature enough to receive mystery truth. And that's just completely wrong. Paul tells everyone about Timothy in 1 Corinthians 4, way back at the beginning, uh, he tells them that Timothy teaches, preaches, uh, reminds everybody about what Paul preached in every assembly everywhere. Paul didn't preach, did mystery to some assemblies and just the cross to other assemblies. Uh, he didn't just, he preached the same thing to every assembly. Uh, and here, I suggest we have a reason that Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, not so much because they were so spiritually advanced, but because they were at least beginning to lose the hope of their calling. In other words, they were beginning to throw away mystery truth. Uh, look in verse 18, he says uh, he wants God Father to fill their inner spirit with wisdom that comes from the revelation of the mystery. Uh, that's from back in verses 8 and 9, uh, in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The inner man enlightened. Remember at the end of Romans uh, when you had uh, the state of fallen humanity? What did he say there about the state of the heart of fallen humanity? They were darkened hearts, foolish hearts. Now you come to what we have the privilege of being involved in, and it's in wizened hearts, I guess you could say, and enlightened hearts. Uh, finally, uh, we're part of his new creation that can radiate his light, radiate his glory, uh, display these things. Uh, and what fallen humanity couldn't do, uh, this new creation in Christ, us in Christ, the body of Christ, uh, was created anew. The hope of the calling is to be the reflectors of his glory. And in order to do that, you have to have enlightened hearts and filled with the wisdom of God. The very thing you didn't have when you were part of fallen humanity, we now have uh, access to, at least, as his new uh, humanity. And he's the father of glory. Uh, some, I think there's even some translations that will winnow that down to the glorious father. Uh, they turn it from uh, being the source of glory to the describing the father. Well, I'm not denying he is the glorious father, but that's not really Paul's point here. Paul's point when he says the father of glory, he's the father, he's the source of all glory. Any other glory that you think is glory that doesn't come from the Father really isn't glory. You're just deceived. All glory, all true glory comes from the Father. He's the source of glory. And here's the kicker, what Ephesians is all about here. He, here's the kicker, he has involved us in his glory. What an amazing thing. I'm surprised everyone didn't jump off their chair and, and scream or something. Now, I don't want you to scream, uh, but, uh, you know, at least maybe a nodding of the head or something. All right. So in this prayer, Paul prays that we might fully know him and understand him. If Paul prays we might fully know and understand him, what is possible? He's not going to pray an impossible prayer. It means we can fully know God. Uh, we can fully know what he's doing today. We can know him through the Son, and we're invited in doing that. I can't imagine uh, the, uh, anyone more important knowing than God, and he's made himself accessible. See, he didn't have to do that. He could have just gone off to the far reaches of heaven and left 
uh, the fallen humanity, to fall in the darkness of fallen humanity. Instead, he came down, entered into fallen humanity, and saved it. Uh, and not just saved it, reconnected it to God, uh, and through God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, God the Father, all working in and through us, making himself known to us. That's the kind of God we have. He's not some cranky old man in the sky with his cudgel just waiting to take people down, uh, knock people down. Uh, he's this glory. He went to the extent of sending his own son to die, to die on a cross so that he could save uh, all those uh, sinners, as he could save fallen humanity uh, by forming a new group, this is the hope of the calling, a new group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ. There's no greater privilege uh, in the world. Uh, and when we understand, know, and he says we can know and understand this. Now it's not just know and understand. You know, I know and understand some things, but I might not really care. Uh, I might not like that I know it. I might even throw it away. Knowing and understanding really isn't the end of the goal. Knowing and understanding so that we might rejoice and appreciate him and understand, cry out that Abba, Father of our sonship position, whereby uh, he's brought us as adult sons and daughters into his family so that he can make, he can share with us his business plan if we want to think of this as a corporation or something. The father share, brings us into his family as adults. You know, you don't share the business plan, the corporate plan, with your baby in the crib or your toddler running around. You don't bring them to the business meetings. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to uh, take it in. You do that with adult sons and daughters. And uh, father has brought us into his family as adult sons and daughters so that we he can reveal to us his business plan, and as adult sons and daughters, we could cry out a father recognizing that's the best plan there is. There is no better will. There is no better way of doing it. The father's plan is the best. Abba, father, not my will, but thy will. And only adult children can do that. Uh, toddlers aren't going to know what's right and wrong. Uh, babies aren't going to understand that. Adult sons and daughters can appreciate, not just know and understand, but appreciate, not just appreciate, but participate in the father's uh, business, the father's business plan. Uh, and here, Paul, this is the sonship uh, sonship prayer. He doesn't just uh, go into God's presence and tell God what to do. Uh, you know, solve all my problems or something, uh, and then go wait for God to do it. God's already done everything. Through his son, he's already done it. He's already given us everything he's giving. Now we go into the presence of the Lord, prayer and commune with him about the things he's done for us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That generates within us requests that are in accord with his will, and then we go out and do it. Total difference. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's going to fulfill, he's going to answer his own prayer request. After communing with the Father, he's going to then give them the answer to their prayer. And he's going to tell them about the hope of his calling. He's going to tell, tell them about their, his, them being the, his inheritance. Uh, and he's going to talk about his exceeding great power. So this, what is the hope of his calling? Why did God call him out? See, this is the key question. That's why it's the first one in this list. If you don't understand this, then you're not going to understand much uh, because this is the key question. The question is, why did God uh, call out another group of redeemed humanity? Remember, he's already called out uh, the nation of Israel, believing Israel, uh, the believing, what we call that believing remnant of Israel. He's going to, after this dispensation of grace, he's going to restart his program with Israel and he's going to work with uh, the believing Israel again. The question is, why did God have to create a new group of redeemed humanity? Why did he have to do that? That's the key question. Uh, and if you miss that, that's what the Ephesians, I think, were beginning to lose. Why did God have to call out from among the Gentiles, uh, especially the Gentiles, a new group? Remember Gentiles, idol worshiping. Uh, uh, ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. Why did he go uh, call out to the world, especially the Gentiles, and call out unto himself and create a new group of redeemed humanity? 
So that's the key question to everything. Why did he do that? Now, most of historic Christianity says he didn't do that. Most of Christianity says uh, he, he got tired and didn't succeed with the nation of Israel. He never really was going to use a literal physical nation of Israel. Uh, so he's thrown, permanently thrown the nation of Israel away, and we just take her place. We're spiritual Israel. You understand that's what most of historic Christianity teaches. But that's completely wrong. Paul says you got to know the reason why God called us out, why he's calling out, especially among the Gentiles today, and creating of them a new group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ. We have a unique situation. We have a, neat, a unique purpose. And he's going to explain the purpose is heavenly. The nation of Israel, he's, going to, he's called out a group of redeemed humanity from call, we call believing Israel, and he's going to use them to reestablish his glory on earth. He called out now in this mystery program another group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ that he's especially going to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. That's why he called us out. Uh, and... He's going to do this. He's going to display uh, the, his grace and mercy and kindness uh, through us. He's, we looked at last week, 2 Corinthians 5. He's rec he's, we're sent out with this work to carry the word of reconciliation. He's reconciled the world to himself. Fallen humanity, especially idol-worshiping, ungodly sinners on enemy status before him, the Gentiles, and he's offered them freely. He's reconciled them. You know, reconcile means make your enemy, bring your enemy back into a relationship with you. Uh, he's reconciled the enemy world unto himself through the personal work of his son on that cross. And now we're sent out with the ministry of proclaiming that reconciliation. Be ye reconciled. If there's anyone here who hasn't answered the call, be ye reconciled. The reconciliation God provided through his son on that cross is big enough to include everyone. But those who, but you got to receive, he's not going to force you to be reconciled to him. It's all big enough and it's offered to everyone but as a free, gracious gift, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The good news of the death and resurrection of Christ uh, for sinners. Believe on that and you receive the reconciliation that's available to everyone but is received by faith. It's given graciously. It's offered by grace in peace and it's received by faith. Be ye reconciled. That's really the only question you need to answer in life, right? Are you reconciled to God? He's reconciled with you. The question is, are you reconciled with him? That's the question. So we get this, uh, this first thing here, what is the hope uh, of God's calling? It's very clear. Why did God have to call out another group of redeemed humanity? Pivotal question. Paul answers it in this epistle, in this passage, and this epistle. And I, so I made a chart. Now, don't make fun. I, I, you wouldn't believe how long it took me to get the lines that straight, because my hand is kind of like... So just get, get, take the general gist here. Don't be too picky. Uh, but let's follow their hope. If they've been losing hope, let's look at the history hope of hope in Ephesus. So go to chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12. Where did they start out? Where does everybody in the world start out? Verse, chapter 2, verse 12. That uh, at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, the strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. So there you got the baseline. Uh, at this time, before Paul arrived on the scene, there were a bunch of Gentiles. They had no hope of their own. They were hopeless. Now, when Israel, God was still working in his prophetic program with Israel, the Gentiles had no hope of their own, but they could participate in Israel's hope. 
Now Paul comes along. Israel has rejected their king and Messiah. God has temporarily cast the nation aside. He's put their prophetic program on hold. The kingdom gets in abeyance. Now the Gentiles are doubly hopeless. They never had a hope of their own, but they could have participated in Israel's hope. Now Israel's been, her program's been cast away. What hope was for, for uh, the, uh, the Gentiles? And that's where we get to chapter uh, 15 of, of, of uh, Romans. But let's just kind of keep starting here. Notice he says he has in verse 12, no hope and without God in the world. So now they have no hope. Here Paul comes to town, Israel's, God has cast away his nation of Israel temporarily, but cast away, uh, and now they're doubly hopeless. Paul comes stumbling through town uh, in Ephesus, and he comes on a personal visit, uh, and he offers them hope. Let's see what kind of hope it is. Keep your finger here, but go to Romans 15. This is, if you want uh, one verse to memorize, this is certainly one of them especially when you understand it in the context of the first of the whole chapter of 15. But look at chapter uh, 13. He goes through this. We're not going to read all, three, all, all the verses here leading up to this, but you've got to get the flow of this no hope. They're hopeless. They have no hope. Their only hope, and he gives a bunch of Old Testament references, was to worship God with Israel and through her rise. That's the prophetic program. But Israel has stumbled and fallen. He just said that in Romans 11. So now the, if, if you didn't have verse 13, we would all be completely, doubly, eternally hopeless. But thank goodness, it doesn't stop at verse 12. It goes on to verse 3. He takes them to the very point of their utter hopelessness, and he says, verse 13, my favorite, uh, I, I know, every verse I'm at is my favorite verse in Paul's epistles at that point. But this one is repeatedly my favorite verse, uh, and this is it. Now the God of hope, the God of when uh, we were completely, doubly hopeless, had no hope, the God of hope kicked into action. And he raised up the Apostle Paul. Let's keep reading here. Fill you with all joy and peace. There you have that reconciliation concept. Uh, in peace and peace in believing that ye may abound. The idea there is superabound, avalanche, and overflow in hope. In light of Israel's stumbling and fall that made the Gentiles now hopeless, hopeless, the God of hope kicked into action, and he uh, provided not just a little hope they had in Israel's prophetic program, they now have super abounding hope, their own hope. Super abound through the power of the Holy Spirit. And how did he do that? If we kept reading the next few verses, he did that by raising up the Apostle Paul to take out salvation and his blessings to the Gentiles apart from Israel and through her fall exactly what we needed and what a shame that most of historic Christianity has thrown away that understanding and mixes it all together and confuses it and doesn't know the hope of their calling so we started out uh, before Paul's ministry uh, it's setting aside of Israel now the Gentiles are doubly hopeless uh, and Paul comes stumbling through town and offers them super abounding overflowing avalanching hope that's my straight line I know it's not very straight that's my straight to the high point of hope super abounding hope uh, we read that in verse in chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 we just read it in Romans 15 13 let's go look at Colossians now Colossians 1 verse 27 what gives us this hope I just told it to you without using the word uh, Paul, God raised up Paul to take out his light and glory, his blessings and salvation to the world apart from Israel and through her fall. What's the one word for that? The mystery. <laughs> oh, why everybody should just shout that. That's the mystery. Raising up a Paul to take out his blessings to the world, especially the Gentiles, 
uh, providing them with superabounding hope apart from Israel and through her fall, just what they needed. That's the mystery. That's the mystery in a nutshell. The ra- I'm going to say it again because nobody jumped up and, and f- filled in the blank spot. So I better repeat it. When Paul comes on the scene, he, God raised him up to take his blessings and salvation out to the world apart from Israel through her fall. That's the mystery. It's that simple. Don't make it any more complicated. Romans opens up by declaring, Romans 1.5, the apostleship of Paul, whereby God sent him out to make for obedience of the faith among the Gentiles, apart from Israel and through her fall. That's what makes it the mystery. The Romans ends, Romans 16.25 ends with my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which had been kept secret since the world began. That's why it's a mystery. He's revealing it now. It's not a mystery any longer. It shouldn't be. Uh, It's a mystery, I guess, to most of historic Christianity, but not because God's been hiding it, uh, but because they've been rejecting it. Uh, And that's what establishes us today. The mystery. From beginning to end, the very fact Paul going out to the Gentiles apart from Israel through her fall, that's the mystery. And he provided it to give them super abounding hope. They didn't have any hope on their own. They could participate in Israel's hope, but Israel, because of rebellion and rejection of Christ, has been temporarily cast aside, and now the Gentiles are hopeless. Hopeless, hopeless. So God raised up Paul. And he sent them to go give them super, not just a little hope, like they could have participated in Israel's program, which would be a great hope in itself, but a superabounding, greater hope of their own. And that's through Paul, uh, and he raised up Paul to take his hope, his blessings, his light, his glory, his salvation out to the Gentiles. I'll say it again, apart from Israel and through her fall. And that's the mystery. And so he left, he was there, let's say, uh, I thought I'd put times on here, Uh, but okay, so you have, and no hope, that's greater than, we'll call it, we'll say he was there about 10 years before in person. Uh, So you have no hope, greater than 10 years before, they had no hope. Uh, The only hope they had was they could participate in Israel's hope through the local synagogues, Uh, but now that God's cast that aside, uh, so they don't even have that access to that hope. Paul comes down the scene and says, I have superabounding hope, and it's your own hope. It's the hope of the world, Jew and Gentile alike, but numerically, especially the Gentiles. And he gives them their own superabounding hope. And notice how steep that line is. Instantaneous, he just gives it to them, well, God gives it to them through his preaching. Uh, and what is this hope? So now we have the mystery firmly in our heads. Where does this hope come from? Verse 26, Colossians 1, verse 26. Even the mystery, remember? God raised up Paul to send his blessings out to the world, especially the Gentiles, apart from Israel and through her fall. The mystery. What he says in, in Romans 15, 13 and following, he uses the definition of the mystery. Now in Colossians 1, he uses the word mystery. To whom or, and that was hid, uh, that which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is manifest to his saints. How is it made not manifest? Paul came to town and preached. To whom God made known what is the riches of the glory. You see, it's, he can't even really put this in words. What is the riches of his glory? Excuse me, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Christ in the Gentiles, Christ uh, in a a redeemed group made up primarily of Gentiles, whose history was hopeless, who were idol-worshiping Gentiles on enemy status before him, ungod, and he creates of them his own group, his in Christ group, and Christ in them group. Uh, And that provides, look at the last phrase here, here's the one we're looking for, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. That's where our hope comes from. 
the mystery. We participate in the hope God's made available through the distinct apostleship of Paul apart from Israel and through her fall. One day, when this dispensation is over, uh, this dispensation of grace, I call it the uh, ambassadorial stage of the mystery program. Once this is over, God's going to restart his program with Israel, and he's going to return to using believing Israel as his conduit of blessings to the Gentiles. But now Israel's been set aside, uh, and he's raised up Paul now to fill this void. Well, who's going to supply a hope to the Gentiles? And God opens a way of blessings to the Gentiles through Paul's apostleship. And notice the steep mark. And then they stay there. Uh, Maybe they stay there. I don't know how long. But now fast forward. You're going through, let's say he was there 10 years before, 7 to 10 years before. So you get one year later. He leaves town one year later, two years later, three years later, four years later. Let's say five years later. And he hears something. Notice, oh, go back to Ephesians. Notice what he says here in verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard. So he's not there in person. He's hearing this through someone else. uh, And he hears, perhaps one, two, three, four, five years later, he hears that they're losing their hope. And what does uh, it mean when we say they're losing their hope? What is the corollary of that? What do we just read in Colossians 1? Where does the hope come from? It's the hope that comes from the mystery. So if they're losing their hope, what are they doing? They're losing aspects of mystery truth. And I, I'm being kind when I say losing uh, because uh, it probably the better word would be willfully throwing away like what most of historic Christianity has done ever since, willingly throwing away aspects of the mystery. Uh, They believed, so they have at least, they believed the gospel of their salvation up in verse 13. So they have at least that aspect, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ for sinners. They at least have that. They believe that. They're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But now they're starting to throw away other aspects of the mystery. So what does Paul do? He hears about this. One, two, three, four, let's say five years later. What? Pick a number. Uh, and what does he do? Go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, uh, verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And then look at this interesting thing that's in parentheses. As I wrote a four in few words. Now what did he write before in few words? Uh, some people suggest it's just what he just wrote in chapters 1 and 2. And that would, that would work. It's probably considered a few words. Uh, I don't think that's the right answer. Other people suggest it's the book of Romans. Uh, I have some Acts 2 dispensations that say it's the book of Romans. But you know why they say that? I mean, no one, I think, would say the book of Romans is a few words. Uh, the book of Romans is a pretty big book. Uh, but they think... Paul only talked about the mystery in chapters, uh, in chapters 9, 10, 11, or really uh, in chapter 11. So they think that's a few words. But I've already demonstrated, starting in the first verses of Romans all the way to the last verses of Romans, including Romans 15 and Romans 8, 9 to 11, and Romans 3, they're all mystery truth. So I'm going to throw away that it's the book of Romans uh, because as people say that uh, because they don't understand the mystery uh, is the very basis of the book of Romans. He doesn't just talk about it in Romans 11. Uh, It's the very basis for his whole apostleship. Uh, So you could be the first two chapters of Ephesians, uh, but I'm going to suggest another uh, explanation. I'm thinking a few years later he hears they're losing their hope because they're throwing away aspects of the mystery. And he writes them a short letter. He thinks he can correct the problem with a short letter. We don't have it in the scriptures. He wrote letters to the Corinthians that aren't in the scriptures. He wrote a lot of letters uh, that, and that, that aren't included in the scriptures. He wrote them a, a short letter thinking he'd correct. It would just take a little letter to correct their errors. And they're drifting away from mystery truth. And now we get the book of Ephesians that evidently didn't work. So now he writes the book of Ephesians, this, his, I guess you could call it his magnum opus, 
on the mystery, they get great in-depth, in-detail, explanation, full explanation of every aspect of God's mystery program. And he's hoping, uh, so now if we follow our chart, they went from no hope to have super abounding, avalanching, overflowing hope. Uh, they were going along and now they've started to lose their hope, which means they've started to throw away aspects of the mystery. And he's coming down, he's heard of it, he wrote, writes him a short letter. It doesn't work. Now, here, seven to ten years after that, he writes him a big letter that goes into full detail, full explanation of this mist, the revelation of the mystery, all its implications, all that they need to know. And now Paul's hope, knows my play on here on hope, Paul's hope is that they regain their hope. And how are they going to regain their hope? Well, if hope, our hope comes from the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, well, then they're going to regain their hope by regaining those aspects of the mystery truth they've thrown away. And Paul's hope, this is the slide with the way it's supposed to work, the way Paul hoped it would work. Uh, and that sh this epistle should have brought them back up to where they were before. Uh, and that's supposed to be a straight line. I'm not suggesting they dip a don't in here. That's supposed to be, they're supposed to just go on forever like that. And then just think if they had, just think if Asia Minor had actually received the mystery. Uh, they might have gone on, and they, from Asia Minor, they might have been the source of sound doctrine to the whole world, especially the Eastern world. Uh, and instead, uh, I would like to hope with Paul, but we now have the, the uh, hindsight to look back on. Probably it didn't, just like the short epistle, uh, the short letter he wrote earlier, uh, this one apparently didn't work, or didn't work for long either, uh, because uh, we learn in 2 Timothy 1.15 that all in Asia, that's Asia Minor, uh, which would include Ephesus, all in Asia Minor had turned away from Paul. Just think if they'd stayed with Paul. They could have started a, 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 a sound doctrinal system that could have gone out to the world. Pauline grace mystery truth uh, to the world. They were at the center. They're one of the major centers in the world. This Ephesus, middle of Turkey. It's, it's like this convergence going uh, through the different continents. They all go through Ephesus in this middle of what's modern day Turkey. Just think what they could have been. Instead, based on history, uh, do you know, we, it was, it, I'm told by historians, we actually have a letter. I forget the guy's name now because I wasn't gonna, didn't plan on mentioning this, but we actually have a letter from someone, and it was a, who, uh, I, I guess he called himself a bishop in Ephesus. And they're pretty sure the letter is from the end of the first century, which would just be maybe a decade, two decades, three decades after Paul. And there's this big long letter and they mention Peter, they mention John, they mention the 12. And you know this big long letter? You know who they never mention? Not even, this is the bishop of the church in Ephesus uh, shortly after Paul leaves the scene. No mention of Paul. They've thrown him away. They've turned away from him. Uh, and, of course, in the Eastern Christianity, what do they do? They replace Paul with John to make it look biblical. And in the Western world, they replace Paul with Peter to make it look biblical so they could deceive people into going along with their religious system. Just think if this had worked. They might have uh, been such a force in the Eastern world and that might have also impacted the Western world as well, but probably not. If it did work, it was probably a short time. All right, so when we understand that, uh, we'll know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Uh, when we, he goes through here, go back to Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, and he says, here's these three things. He says, Lord, uh, God of glory, uh, fill these Ephesians up with, the, with your wisdom that comes from the revelation of the mystery uh, that will bring them into full knowledge of who you are and what you're doing. 
And then he goes and answers the prayer, and he says, yeah, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to answer the prayer myself, I'm going to tell them about the hope of their calling. Once we know the hope of his calling, why he called us out, why he created a new group of redeemed humanity, we're not spiritual Israel, we're not rehashed Israel, we're not Israel, we don't replace Israel. He created us a new, a new group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ, uh, and he did it because he's creating a new group that's going to be uh, his inheritance, his displayers of glory. And when we understand that, when we begin to understand he's making us into his inheritance, we can think. We're all thinking people, right? We can think, perhaps, uh, this is going to take a lot of power. But we can, that can give us hope, too, because God he has already displayed his power. Look at verse 20, uh, or verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Notice it's toward us who believe. He's bringing up this example because it's the power he's working toward us. He's doing something to fulfill his purpose and why he called us out and created a new group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So he raised, he displayed this power. We can have 100% certain hope because he's already displayed. He has the power because he raised Christ from the dead, exalted him through the mostly hostile heavenly realm and seated him at his own right hand. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion every name that's named and not only in this world in this age but also in that which is to come he's powerfully done this he's uh, verse 22 and put all things under his feet remember he's how he introduces this is his power toward us displayed when he raised Christ from the dead, exalted him through the hostile heavenly realm, seated him at his own right hand, far above all power and principality. And now get the kicker here, verse 22, the power, this power for us, he's doing this all for us. Verse 22, and hath put all things under his feet. He took the whole old creation and subjected it under his feet. And you know why he did that? Because he had to clear out a space. He had to clear, restructure the whole universe. He had to reorganize the creation. He had to take the old creation and put it under his feet so that he can make this big area, this big room for us in Christ. He takes us, the body of Christ, and puts us under his head. And connected to the head, he fills us, he says here, fill, fills us with his fullness that filleth all in all. Is that enough power for you? Is that enough purpose for living? I hope so, because I don't think you'll find a purpose for living greater than that. He's, he is so de de determined to fulfill his promises, uh, to fulfill the reason, the purpose he called us out from among the Gentiles, made us into his own inheritance, and powerfully reorganized the whole creation, subjecting the old creation under his feet to make room for us as new creation. Connect us to the head and uh, where he's filling us with all the fullness of God. So someone back there who will go nameless said, but no sound came out. So we're getting closer. We're getting closer. All right. So that's, I mean, I can't, <laughs> I, I can't even put this in words. This is too amazing. He took, do you see what he's saying here? If we go back to that hope, he took a bunch of hopeless Gentiles born into the world in the quicksand of sin and death, uh, ungodly sinners on enemy status before him, part of fallen, rebellious humanity, idol worshipers uh, in one form or another, uh, and he took them and he called, he offered them reconciliation. You can be reconciled. Christ's work on the cross reconciled the whole fallen, cre uh, whole fallen humanity and now Paul's been sent out to say, be ye reconciled to God. Receive it by faith. Believe in the person and work of his son. And then, uh, see, religious systems, uh, depending on which one you pick, you know, they'll say uh, he kind of just pulled you out of the quicksand of sin and death and left you on your own. Or maybe he hosed you off too, cleaned you up a bit, gave you a second chance, uh, will put you in, in, back in the Garden of Eden. 
No, you got to throw all the way that religious mumbo jumbo. Christ, yes, he did pull you out of the quicksand of sin and death by grace through faith. And then he didn't just hose you off. Uh, he raised you up, enlivened you, made you alive, raised you together with Christ, exalted you through the heavenly realm together with Christ, and seated you together with Christ in the heavenlies below his head, not under his feet. You know, if uh, I would much rather be under someone's head than under someone's feet, right? Because what happens when you're under someone's feet? You get trampled. He's placed us under it. He's powerfully, this is what he's done toward us. He's powerfully reorganized the universe to clear out space so that he could place his new creation, the body of Christ. And I'll say it again, connecting us, to, uh, below, uh, placing us under his head, connecting us to the head, filling us with his fullness. He didn't just pull us out, give us a second chance. He created us anew in Christ. Uh, and that's, that's everything. Uh, there's nothing, if you're waiting for something to better come along, I, I hate to tell you, you might not, it's pro, well, I'm not, it's not going to come along. You're not going to get any better than that. So if these are the three things, let's just use a little uh, common sense here, a little practical thinking. If they, these are the three things uh, that God says we need to know, the church, the body of Christ needs to know this. The hope of, you need to know what the hope of the calling is, of his calling is. Why did he call, why did he have to call out a bunch of mostly Gentiles uh, and create of them a new group of redeemed humanity? Well, he had to do it because he wants to turn them into his inheritance, to be the displayers of his glory. And he's so sure that he's going to fulfill this purpose, he's already reorganized the whole creation through the personal work of his son on that cross, so to make clear out room, uh, and he's placed us under his head where we're filled with his fullness. Those are the three things he wants us to know. And if you uh, listen to that flow chart, and it doesn't make you want to scream for joy like someone just did in the back, although nothing came out of the actual mouth, then uh, you'll understand this. So now, just ask a question. These are the three most fundamental things you need to know. So what's Satan going to be doing? He, you got to get rid of the whole Hollywood thing. He's not a red dragon spitting fire with a tail and a pitchfork. He's not making young women's heads twirl around on their necks or doing. You got to throw away all that. He comes and he operates through men clothed in righteousness, men who claim to be working for God. Uh, if you, uh, for Second Corinthians eleven. He, he's going to try. You want to know how Satan's working in the world today? He's not taking over territory. He's not possessing. He's not doing that. He's tr through false teaching leading us away from those truths. And you know how he leads us away from those truths? It's not getting you into satanic worship or gross immorality. He's doing that through uh, our own uh, man-made religious systems and man-centered theological systems who are in the predicament of the Ephesians. They've lost their hope. They don't understand the hope of their calling. They think God has just called them out to replace Israel and we're just carrying on Israel's program. That's the way Satan works. Lead us away from these truths. But you see, if you don't know uh, the hope of your calling, uh, our hope of calling is that we're members of the body of Christ and his mystery program. I see you're going to get confused, and you're going to confuse it with Israel's calling, with his calling and his prophetic program. If we don't know God's inheritance in us in accord with his mystery program, we'll get confused and think we are God's inheritance in accord with his prophetic program. It just brings in all kinds of confusion. But you know what's really uh, satanic? Now throw away what you usually think of with satanic, this is satanic and the deceptive, because it's so deceptive, uh, he leads you away and the lead are led away from God's truth for today, but you think you're honoring God. You think you're being spiritual. Isn't that the worst kind of deception? Uh, isn't that the only kind of deception? You're deceived and you don't know you're deceived. The only way you're going to know you're deceived is if you get back into God's word. And they'll lead you away. It just brings confusion and confusion 
Uh, we aren't waiting uh, for an earthly kingdom. We're waiting for a heavenly kingdom where Christ is seated and where we already are seated together with him. We're going to be looking at earthly things. We're going to, instead of be rejoicing about our spiritual blessings in heavenly places, we're going to be uh, mad that God hasn't given us more physical blessings in the earthly places. Go to Colossians. Colossians 3. Look at Look at this. He says here, Colossians 3. See, if you don't understand, our purpose is heavenly. Israel's purpose was earthly. Then you're, you see, you're going to not worry about the heavenly. It seems so distant, so out of your real, real world. Uh, and you're just going to focus on the physical and the earthly. But look what Paul says here, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. If ye be risen with Christ, and if you're a believer in the body of Christ, you've been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And what do we read? We've read enough. We haven't gotten there in Ephesians 2. It says, we're seated there together with him. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. See, if you follow the satanic and the idea of the deceptive plan of Satan, uh, see, you're going to confuse all that. You're not going to know what God's doing today. You're not going to know the hope of your calling. You don't know. You're going to know how God's making you his, into his inheritance, uh, and you're not going to understand how he's powerfully working. The measure of God's power in Israel's prophetic program was what? Whenever uh, in God, the non-Pauline scriptures, whenever they talk about God's power, what do they mention? The Exodus. There's gonna, they're going to go through another greater exodus. That's the measure of Israel's pr pr power. Our measure of power, according to Ephesians here, uh, is the raising of the Lord Jesus Christ, exalting him through the hostile uh, heavenly realm, seating him at his own right hand, and when he did that, he took us with, uh, with him, put us under his head, and filled us with his fullness. To operate according to our adult sonship position, we need to understand and appreciate these things. Uh, God powerfully called us into his service. Uh, he's this flayers of his glory, especially in the heavenlies. Uh, and as recipients of the riches of his grace, we become the displayers, the reflectors, the radiators of his grace. This was all just for his good pleasure. You know what gave God good pleasure? In eternity past, before creation, he, he knew what he was going to do. He's got this all mapped out. He wasn't taken by surprise by anything. Eternity past, he said he, something to, he got a chuckle out of something. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something nobody would guess I'm going to do. And it gives me pleasure just doing it. I'm going to not reclaim, reestablish my glory in the heavenlies through the angels. Isn't that what we'd all think? He'd reclaim his glory on earth through humans. Humans belong on the earth. And then he'd reclaim his glory in the heavenlies through angels, good angels. But God, eternity passed, he got a little chuckle. He said, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to have a secret I'm going to have a secret way whereby I'm a mystery whereby I'm going to reclaim the heavenly realm, not through the good angels, but through another group of redeemed humanity called the body of Christ. That's the hope of our calling. That's the purpose of why he's made us into his inheritance, the displayers of his glory, especially in the heavenly, uh, in the heavenly realm. He had this secret. This mystery. That's why Paul, over and over in the first half of Ephesians 1, he says, it's just for the good pleasure as well. He delighted in this. He got a big chuckle out of this in eternity past. This is something no one will figure, figure out. I have this mystery program, and through it, I'm not going to reclaim the heavenly realm through the angels. That's what everyone would think. Even Satan and the fallen angels would think that. I'm going to reclaim the heavenly realm through this gr new group of redeemed humanity. That's our purpose. That's our calling. Uh, that's why God called us out. And if we throw away Pauline grace mystery truth, we throw away that hope. God delighting in us uh, should cause us to delight in him. Uh, and uh, I really want to get to one passage. So we're going to move ahead 
a little bit. You can go back to those slides. This is sanctification. Sanctification is just a th big theological word. It just means set apart for God's purpose. That's all it means. Don't make it any, uh, any more spooky or anything than that. Set apart for God's purpose. Uh, we are set apart for his purpose. We're sanctified. Holy is just another word for sanctified. Set apart uh, for his purpose. And we're now to remain occupied on him. Uh, what you're occupied on is what you become. That's the, that's the uh, they, I think they call it the general principle of idolatry. What you worship, you become. We, as God's new creation in Christ, uh, what are we worship? What are we, as our soul occupying on Christ? Uh, and that brings us to the passage I really want to get to as we close. So go to 2 Corinthians. Amazing passage in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're not going to go back into this chapter. Uh, it's just important. Maybe one important thing is look at verse 3. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. The important thing to remember here is in 2 Corinthians, the main reason for the letter is Paul is defending and advancing and confirming his apostleship. Why is that important? Well, he's defending and confirming his apostleship because that's the source of hope to the Gentiles. Otherwise, what? They're hopeless. And it comes from the riches of the glory of the mystery. So he's defending his apostleship here. Uh, and he writes this thing, this about the Holy Spirit. We're not going to go in every detail, chapter 3. I just want to get to the last couple verses. Uh, but for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, so they're, they're the epistle of Christ. There, get, get this, they're the epistle of Christ. Uh, they're the paper God wrote Christ on. Christ wrote on them. Well, the Spirit wrote on them, Christ. Uh, but look at what it says here. The epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in, in fleshly ta ta tables of the heart. So here we have the key thing. This is Paul's apostleship. Uh, Paul's ap Moses' uh, ministry, he, had, he used uh, God's word engraved in stone. The new covenant, Paul's going to go on to say here, his point is you don't have to go back to the old covenant. That was just external engraved in stones. And you don't need to go to the Israel's new covenant because in Israel's new covenant, all that accomplished is having the law written in your hearts. He says here the phenomenal, astonishing thing that through his ministry, the Holy Spirit is now writing Christ on the heart. You don't need to go back to Israel's program, right? You have something better, he's telling these Corinthians. Uh, you have my apostleship, which is accomplishing infinitely more than Moses under the old covenant or Israel in that new covenant. Now, Christ through the Spirit is writing Christ on the heart. Now, keep that in mind because that's going to be important. He's going to go through this whole thing. If you want to kind of have fun with the passage, Read down verse 6, down through it, and you follow the veil. He's going to talk about this veil. The bottom line is, under God's prophetic program with Israel, under the law according to the flesh, Moses' ministry, they couldn't see the glory. It was hid from them. They were separated from the glory of God. Moses, remember, went in to the, the tent of meeting, to the tabernacle. He went in, communed with God without, with uncovered face. And what did he come out? His face was shining, communing with God. His face is shining. He read the commandments, and then what did he do? Mm -hmm. Covered the glory. That's the law under, excuse me, the law according to the flesh. It had the glory of God was hid. It was, they couldn't... They were afraid of it, and probably for good reason. It'd probably come out and consume them. And he covered it. And then Moses died, and now the veil gets transferred to the reading of the law, the reading of Moses' writings. And uh, now the, law, the veil moves to the reading of the law. Uh, and he talks about their blinded minds and hardened hearts. 
Then the veil moves again. I don't know, I think of it as moving, but maybe it's more like a hot potato. It just keeps hopping from place to place. It goes from over Moses' face to over the, uh, the reading of the Moses' scriptures to then over the hearts of those. Once you get to Paul's day and the Jews continue to reject their Christ and Messiah, now it's over their hearts. And they're blinded and hardened. And he says here, we'll pick it up uh, at verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. And until this day, now he's talking about the uh, Jews in his day, after the cross and up to Paul's ministry, those Jews. And it says here, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is over their hearts. It was over the face of Moses, it was over the reading of the law, and now it's over their hearts. And what's the only thing that can remove the veil? Uh, the veil is uh, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be removed. Uh, the only thing that's going to remove the veil uh, is so they can come into the full glory of God is Christ, receiving Christ. All right, now that little bit of background, oh, I hate that clock. That clock must go fast, because I know I haven't been talking. We did start late, and that was a long song. So uh, just one or two more minutes, just maybe three. OK, so the only way is Christ, and now Christ through Paul's apostleship. Get this, what uh, Israel couldn't do, what was hidden from them, uh, now everyone, not just Moses, everyone can see and enter into the full glory of God. Look at what it says here in verse uh, 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. So let's follow, here's another one. We were talking about the bouncing veil. Now it's just the bouncing Lord. He's gonna use, there's gonna be three ways he uses Lord here. He's gonna say, now the Lord is that spirit. Well, what's the spirit? It's the Lord, God, the Holy Spirit. And what did we just read in verse 3? What's God, uh, the Lord, God, the Holy Spirit doing? He's writing Christ on their hearts through Paul's apostleship and ministry. So we have God, keep track of these. I keep saying God, I mean Lord, God, the Holy Spirit. And what's he doing? He's writing Christ on the heart. That brings us to the next one, and where the Spirit of the Lord. Now it's, notice it's reversed. Uh, it's the Spirit of the Lord. Now he's referring, who's the Spirit, the spirit of the Lord? Who is the Lord there? It's Lord God the Son. God the Holy Spirit is writing God the, Holy, God the Son in our hearts. And now look what he says. It says, uh, and sets us free. When God the, the Lord, God the Holy Spirit, engraves Christ in our hearts, God the, God the Son, it sets us free, sets us at liberty, gives us a liberty to do something. Now what's the liberty in context? What did Israel not have the liberty to do? They couldn't look upon the glory of the Lord. Now, through Paul's apostleship, he's telling these, you don't have to go back to the God's prophetic room with Israel because my, through my ministry, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is engraving the Lord, God, the Son, and your hearts, and that sets us free, liberates us, verse 13, so that we all, notice that all there, it's not just Paul, you know, it's just Moses, he's the only one, his, shine, his face shined and that was it. Now all believers can look with open face, unfortunately the King James kind of breaks down the moving veil here, uh, this is actually the same word as veil up before, so we could, if we want to tr keep track of the veil, now with unveiled Faces, open faces, unveiled faces, we can behold in a glass the glory of the Lord. Who's that Lord? Uh, it's the Lord God the Father. And we can behold it uh, and from to be changed. You know, when Moses went in, he was this regular uh, Jewish man with, uh, with his complexion, normal human complexion. He goes in and communes with God, uh, and he comes out and his face is shining. Now, through Paul's ministry, every believer goes in and is free, freed through the Holy Spirit and his, the work of his son to go in and uh, commune with God the Father and be changed into the glory 
that, that comes from that. Everyone, uh, and we will close with this because otherwise I know there's gonna be re rebellion. But uh, maybe I'll summarize it next week, but oh, I really wanted to get through this whole thing. But I'll just say, just to finish off, you can think about it maybe more during the week. This holding as in a glass, what's the glass? If you look over at chapter four, verse six, which I'll probably pick up with next time, it's Paul's epistles. Pauline grace, mystery, truth. We look in to Pauline grace, mystery, truth. We see the face, the glory of the God the Son. And what's God the Son? He's the image of God the Father. We look in the face of God the Son as revealed in Pauline grace, mystery, truth. And the Holy Spirit teaches to us and reveals to us. And it turns us like Moses had made his face shine. Now, of course, our face doesn't literally shine. Uh, but our inner man can be enlightened. Ephesians 1.18, where we are in our prayer, our inner man can shine. Our inner man can be enlightened. Uh, and we can look into the face of uh, the glory of God uh, through Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. Because it's there we see the face of Christ, uh, which is the image of God. Let's close with a word of prayer.